Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. I will. Well, welcome everyone to our March program. It's going to be an exciting one, I can tell. Don't forget, this is weekend is spring forward, so don't forget to change your clocks at two o'clock on Sunday morning, right? <laughs> okay, so to get started on our announcements, I want to welcome our new members. Yay, Michelle Strickland from Idaho, Margaret Vale from Utah, Christina Quirin all the way from Germany, and Andrea Haas from Utah. Welcome, we're so happy to have you. Oh, and we have a celebration. Patricia Till Vincent, she is launching her coaches practice here in Idaho. After years of experience mm -hmm. in supporting social services and healthcare professionals and working international, she is launching. Congratulations, Patricia, mm -hmm. so happy for you. Great success. All right, we uh, have a nominating committee, Todd Hess, is still looking for leadership. And so I'm gonna let him speak for just a minute because he's gonna be your new president starting in May. Todd? Hey, thanks, Vicki. Um, yeah, we every year uh, the board does a uh, transition. The people that have been serving for two, four years, um, they're transitioning off. So we look for new opportunities for people to serve. Really appreciate the people that have stepped up to uh, serve in the, in the coming year, which will start in June. We, uh, our fiscal year is from June to May. And so that's what we're, we're looking for, people that want to volunteer in the coming year. And so we fill the membership positions and programs, um, but we're still currently looking for somebody who would help with um, uh, marketing and communications. Uh, currently it's called marketing and communications, which is really helping with newsletters and um, you get to work with a fantastic website coordinator um, who's, who's moving into this position, this new position next year, um, and with social media, and just really uh, helping with that marketing communication that goes out to our membership and also out to our community as a whole. Um, and so that's what I'm looking for. We also need um, help on the committees. If there's any of those committees that you are interested in, please let myself or Vicki know. And we, um, I guess Stephanie is going to talk about coaching week. Is that correct? Yes. She's going to talk about coaching week. Awesome. That's all I have. Great. Yay. So I'm going to skip on to and let Stephanie introduce herself for the coaching week. Hi, everybody. Um, so last week I met with uh, some of our speakers for ICF Coaching Week, which is May 17th through the 23rd. And we decided on the theme uh, recalculating opportunities. And we're going to do what we did last year. So we'll have um, a panel of, of our coaches speaking every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and we'll split it up by type. So the four themes we discussed were life coaching, career coaching, leadership coaching, and then uh, specifically this year, diversity and inclusion coaching. So I'm still looking for guest speakers within the life, career, and diversity and inclusion buckets. So if you're interested in speaking, um, I'd really appreciate uh, just getting in touch with in touch with me. Um, we're basically expecting about three people uh, per panel. And so it'll be about 15 minutes and uh, all in just an hour of that day. So it'll be around the noon, one o'clock PM uh, mountain time time frame. So uh, if you're interested in helping out, please email me here, uh, Stephanie at IdahoNextStepsCoaching.com. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And it was quite a success last year. So, so please call Stephanie. And our book club is starting March 24th, Good Habits, Bad Habits. So if you haven't scheduled for it, Deb is Armstrong, our last president, is facilitating. And we have Humble Inquiry that Patricia Teal is going to be facilitating. And she's asking that you um, schedule June 16th so you can discuss uh, a good time that everybody that would like to meet and win so that it's convenient for everyone. Okay, our partnership, I'm, I'm just going to bring it up. I bring it up every month. I stand beside them uh, working with United States veterans. They're always looking for coaches to help with themselves and with their families. So especially during and after COVID, there's yeah, a great need. Social media, LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. 
You can go tweet. <laughs> Earnings these ears, just a reminder. You've already registered, so you did number one. Attend the event from start to finish, complete the program survey, and your uh, CCEU credits are free after you've completed your feedback survey, because we really need that information. If you're a guest and you are looking for CCEUs, it is $20. However, if you're ICF, the cost-benefit ratio is much better to join us because our membership dues is only $20 for ICF members. And then we have CCEUs and resource uh, credits every month. Upcoming events, I already mentioned, mentioned next in April, how we coach makes a difference. New research findings, and that's Jan Salisbury, and she is our founder of the Coaching Association. And we have, let's see, anything new? I won't read it to you, but May looks like an interesting resource development, the six-figure coach by Krista Martin, and we're International Week's done. Okay. Membership benefits, again, I'm not going to read it to you. We have ton and we keep adding more. So please keep coming and staying involved. ICF quarterly credential Q&A, it's on our website. Therefore, you can go at any time there if you want to know more information about how getting your credential and the process. And now it's my honor to introduce mm -hmm. Marsha Reynolds. Dr. Marsha Reynolds is a highly accomplished master certified coach, and she's a pioneer in the field of coaching. She was International Coach Federation's fifth global president and was recently inducted into ICF Circle of Distinction for her contribution to the global coaching community. Dr. Reynolds is president of Co-Visioning, a firm providing leadership training and coaching in 41 countries. She is an esteemed author of five books that have been recognized not only by her peers, but in business and psychological publications worldwide. I'm excited to share Dr. Reynolds' latest bestseller with my coaching students as it further deepens the number one coaching mantra, coach the person, not the problem. Please help me welcome Dr. Marsha Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, stop can you? Share. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, let me get my slides up. I'm always excited to share um, this information. So, uh, actually, in the late 80s, I got my second master's degree in adult learning, um, and uh, I ran training departments for years. And um, I was always looking for how to make my training better because people would like go through the classes and they'd enjoy them and say thank you and give me happy faces on my evaluation forms. Then they'd go out and they'd try new things. Um, and as soon as it got awkward, they went back to old behavior. And I kept trying to improve my training and, and I'm, a, I'm a researcher. I kept you know, looking at what else I could do, make it more participative, do follow-up work. You know, and, and I just seemed to reach a plateau. And then on the day I resigned my last job, uh, somebody handed me an article on this thing called coaching. <laughs> and I said, well, this is interesting. And so I immediately signed up for a coaching school because that's what I do. Um, and I started just seeing as we were coaching each other, the impact, which was different than training. You know, which actually, you know, at the same time, all the work on neuroscience was coming out and I was researching that and it's what inspired me to get my doctorate is like, I have to learn what happens in the brain. So um, what I found was coaching actually works on a different part of the brain than training, mentoring, telling, all those other technologies. Um, I'll explain that a little. But it's why coaching is so powerful that when we coach someone and they have that aha moment, that permanently rewires their brain, which actually then changes their behavior for good. And so I think coaching is the best learning technology we have. So I want to give you a little bit of that because I think it's really important that you're able to um, describe the value of coaching you know, to potential clients and, and to truly understand it yourself. So whenever you have that urge to um, uh, tell someone what to do to give them advice, that you understand why we don't do that. 
So when we look at, you know, the value of coaching, um, what we find is that, you know, people get stuck in their stories. So even if they know it's not the right thing to do, they always have a story. And what we're doing in coaching is we're coaching their stories. And if they can expand and change their story, then it changes who they think they are and how they see the world. Otherwise, you know, it's hard to learn when you already know. And we've all run into people like that. Well, they already know the answers. Um, so they may say, yeah, what you're sharing with me is good, but they already know. And reality, you know, what we think is true out there and we will fight for it. We're still making it up. We're still making it up. You know, it's what our brain, it makes meaning out of what we see. Um, and so again, it, it, when we coach people and we're coaching their stories, we're doing something that they can't do for themselves. They hold on to their reality because it makes them feel safe. And, and uh, to be able to take it out, to take out their thinking and to look at it, it's almost impossible for humans to do that. They need someone external to do that. So that's what we do in coaching is, is that we help them look at and think about their thinking. And especially these days when we have strong emotions, I mean, it's been incredible, hasn't it? With the um, pandemic, the intensity of emotions that people are feeling and the range starting with a lot of fear and then getting into anger and um, all that's going on and they don't even understand what's happening. So it doesn't matter what someone's story is, you may hear it and say, well, how could they believe that? But again, beliefs are inventions that help us make meaning out of ourselves in the world. We wake up in the morning and we have to make meaning. We have to have stories. We have a morning story of what we do in the morning. And all day long, we're pulling out our stories based on past experience that determines what we do without thinking. We don't stop and think, as Daniel Kahneman says in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. We don't stop and think on our own. Coaching makes us stop and think. So what the um, neuroscientists call it, this is where I first heard this, um, is that we disrupt these stories. We disrupt the thinking patterns. So we are the external disruptor by just reflecting, summarizing to someone, so you're telling me this, that alone makes them stop and think about their story in a way they can't do for themselves. So reflection, not just questions. So please don't think that coaching is a questioning, questioning technology, it is not. Um, that reflections are often even more powerful um, and the question is just a follow-up um, that makes them stop and question themselves. And I'm gonna explain that more. Um, so that's what you are, you're a thought disruptor. So when we give people solutions, when we think, oh, what value am I giving if I'm a coach, but I don't ever give them anything, any advice or suggestions? Well, when you do that, you actually pacify their brain. The, the brain actually quiets down unless they get really excited about what you say, they're not even going to fully remember what you told them. But when we summarize what they said, when we ask them questions based on the summary on the paraphrasing, it actually activates their brain, the middle brain where long-term memory is, you know, and, and, and there's a, a rewiring process when we can break through the frames that the brain goes, oh, that's not the way I made meaning of it. I have to see, uh, you know, accept a new meaning. And so it starts to reconnect to create the new meaning. So that's the activity that goes on in the brain. And that's why it's the best technology we have for creating long-term behavioral change. You know, and so again, remember, I came out of the 80s of, of researching learning. And I see coaching as a learning technology it has nothing, it's not a therapy. In fact, the person who defined coaching wrote a book called How We Think in 1910, long before the, the, the popular therapies came out. He was an educational reformer, John Dewey. 
and he's he was trying to get teachers to to get students young students to think more broadly for themselves by just reflecting back so this is what you're telling me and then asking a question and that's what we do in coaching so it actually came out of learning um so I always say, here's the distinction. I'm not giving you solutions and answers. I'm giving you clarity and confidence. When I give you clarity and you can see your stories and see how you're getting in your own way and see what else is possible, you feel more confident to move forward. This is the gift and the value of coaching. It's the gift and value of coaching. Um, and please, if you have questions at any time, you can write them in uh, the chat. And um, I know Stacy will help me. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm happy to answer your questions. So we're always asking the question, what's getting in the way of this smart, resourceful person from seeing a way forward um, from what they want to achieve? So, you know, the ICF definition, sometimes they have the end part of it, sometimes they don't. I'm always amazed when they put it on a website or they take it off. But they say, you know, it's a creative process between two people. But at the end of the definition, which I know because I was there when we wrote it, <laughs> it says that the, the client is creative, resourceful and whole. That didn't come from a specific coaching school. That comment that the client is smart, um, has resources, is creative, came from the uh, the person who's called the, the uh, father of, of, of psychology, Alfred Adler. And he's, he was differentiating um, what we do from uh, psychotherapy from Freud, who says people are broken. And he said, no, people aren't broken. They don't need us to fix them. You know, we just need to help them get out of their own way to clear the fog so they can see more clearly for themselves. So this is the question we're always asking in coaching. And, and yes, it's true. Sometimes, especially if you have a verbal processor, they just need a sounding board. I had a client for eight years. Um, she was a bank president and I would go there and she would talk and occasionally I would summarize and ask a question, not a lot, but there was a key word I just said in that story, she was a bank president. And she didn't have a lot of places where she felt comfortable, safe, to talk through her challenges and problems. She didn't feel she could with her mostly male leadership team. You know, and the whole thing with, you know, the family dynamics and, and the work. Um, and what we provide for our clients is a very safe space. I love that the ICF has a new competency of embodying a coaching mindset um, because it's so important that we you know know how to uh, manage to regulate our emotions not to get caught in their stories not to to be too sensitive you know you can have empathy but you need to release you feel their emotions but you need to let it go and and maintain the safe place coaching may be the only time during a day whether it's um, life coaching or business and corporate coaching. It may be the only time in a day that someone can feel that they can totally be themselves as they explain their challenges, their, their desires in going forward. So that's also the great value we provide is that safe space to explore, to challenge their thinking. You know, people often ask me, and I am going to do a demo for you. They're like, well, how do you get people to be vulnerable with you? And I said, Bill, it's really important that the energy you bring to the coaching, the, the care you have for your client, that you care about them, you trust them, you believe in them. They feel that right off the bat. And once they feel that, then I can challenge their thinking. I can, you know, get them to truly look at what's been difficult for them. And it's okay because I carry that space. So, you know, it's an integration of skill and mindset. And we often, in, when we're learning coaching, focus on skill um, and the proficiency of skill. But we forget that is truly the 
constant development, which is a disciplined practice that lasts forever of being present, of connecting with them, of moving into the we space with them, that that's just as important and that's what's gonna make the skills work. In fact, I'm working on an advanced program now that with a, a good friend of mine, I asked him to mentor me who wrote a book called Collective Wisdom. And I said, I wanna bring that to coaching. How do we create that collective space energetically? So insights emerge with both of us. So I, as a coach, am comfortable with not knowing what's gonna happen. I'm just present and being their thinking partner. That's what we aspire. We aspire to be the best thinking partner we can be. And that's why you can't be in your own head analyzing what they're saying or thinking, you know, whether I should say this or not. You have to be fully present, share what you hear, what you notice, the emotional shifts, and you can be wrong, it doesn't matter. They will then tell you what's really real, but it helps them to think. So we're looking for the blocks, what's blocking them? So we help them to see their stories by reflecting their words, their emotions, their expressions, and then asking questions to help them explore their thoughts. You know, I, when I was writing uh, Coach the Person, um, part of why I wrote it was I was noticing over the past you know, decade, really, the, the trends, the habits in, in defining coaching that were detrimental. That um, uh, I remember somebody who was putting coaching down, he says, well, my clients don't want me just to sit there and ask them questions. And I said, but that's not what a coach does. I, I use reflection even more than questions. And if all you're doing is trying to remember the powerful question, then you're coming out of memory and not presence. I never, ever give out a list of questions because I don't want you to memorize questions. Your questions have to be spontaneous from the interaction. Um, so the, you know, the coaching is questions and, and um, I have to, you know, checklist the competency so I'm stuck in the skills that keeps us out of presence and presence is primary so when I started coaching in the very first class I took it was with Thomas Leonard who started Coach U there was two coaching schools at the time <laughs> Coach U and CTI and he taught our first class and he says you have to go out there and coach that's how you learn how to coach. And we're like, how can we coach? We don't have the skills. He says, it doesn't matter. Just go love them. And I'll never forget that because that's when I first started recognizing it's the energy that I bring. And when I look back at my testimonials from my initial clients, um, where I don't know what I was doing, but they were great. They're like, oh, Marsha really helped me sort through. And and step into my leadership position or figure out my next career move. And, you know, I got better at the skills and I got better at the presence. So we have to integrate both. We have to integrate both. So this is what, you know, I, I think it's important that we, we look at coaching as a reflective inquiry process, not an inquiry process. You know, John Dewey said, questions just seek answers. But inquiry, true inquiry, where we're really curious and we help people to think, that provokes insight. And that's what we're looking for, that insight. Coaching is an insight awareness uh, process um, as in, in terms of learning. And we say it's insight-based learning. You know, there's fact-based learning, fear-based learning, Awareness-based learning, which is close, but, but, but insight-based learning. The aha moment when we get them to break the frame of their story, you know, that's the powerful moment that changes their mind and changes their behavior. And so it's reflective inquiry that we practice. So reflections plus questions enable our clients to climb a tree in their mind 
where they can look down on their thinking, on their stories and gain a wider view, where they can see then the, the old beliefs they're still holding on to the, that no longer serve them. The, the, the assumptions they're making up about the future, you know, which is usually worst case scenario if they don't know. And, and you know, assumptions are predictions and, and is there anything else that's possible? Um, you know, the, the fears that they won't get their needs met or their conflicts of values of family and work and what's getting in the way and what I should do. All those things we help them to look down on and, and to sort through in a way that they can't do it themselves. And the reason we can't, you truly can't coach yourself if there's emotion involved is because the ego stops you from doing that. It says, no, 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 no. And, and when I say ego, I'm just saying identity. Okay, ego isn't bad. We give it a bad rap. Um, ego is just who I think I am. It means I. And um, uh, the brain is a meaning-making machine and, and that's how we're safe. And so it doesn't want you to question it because that feels uncomfortable and you know brain doesn't want you to feel uncomfortable and i'm always in coaching oh who you know feeling uncomfortable that's okay that means something's going on as long as they trust me it's okay it's okay um so the brain is a box of stories and the stories identify who i think i am and how i see my world and this is how we go about our days so when we're coaching people, we're helping them to see their stories. And when they can start to see their stories, then possibly they're able then to change them. This is really what coaching is, what coaching is. So we use reflections, dis and I say disruptive reflections, not that, that it's confrontation, but it disrupts their thinking patterns when we reflect. So we use disruptive reflections and curious questions. So people pause and look inside their story. And just that helps them to see themselves in the world in a different way, in a different way. So as I said, this is called insight-based learning. It's, it's the expansion that happens in the aha moment, the moment of breakthrough. So breaking, Breakthrough, it means I'm breaking through the frame of the story. I'm breaking the frame of the story. And that's what creates that aha moment, that moment of breakthrough. And there's often an emotion attached to that. As soon as I see what I've been doing my, to myself all these years, um, you know, or that I'm embarrassed or sad or angry, <laughs> that's okay. We let that happen because that's all a part of seeing myself and the world around me in a different way. So we never want to stop people from feeling that that's a good sign that something's happening. Something's happening. Even if they get defensive, I always say, so, um, wow, something didn't land right. What's going on? I'm just curious. You know, I'm just always curious about what's going on. I don't let them trigger me and I don't worry about it. I don't worry about it. And this can happen so quickly, you know, um, when I was working in corporate, which I did for 16 years, I was your typical high achiever and worked really hard to be the best and get things done. And, and then I would always complain to my boss about everyone else and he's not managing them and he needs to make them work harder, you know, and that was just my way of getting attention, I'm sure. But I was doing that. I was complaining that they don't do enough. And, and he said to me, wow, it seems that everybody disappoints you. That made me stop and think. And then he came in with the question, will anyone ever be good enough for you? One reflection, one question, and it threw me into like, <gasps> I, I, I gasped, I couldn't even breathe. And I said, boy, I have to think about that. I couldn't even deal with it in the moment. And that will often happen. The coaching happens between the sessions. And when I thought about it, I started recognizing what I had been doing to my relationships all my life. 
that people, you know, just never did things right. And it was never good enough. And I was always complaining or telling them what they should do and, uh, and how that made me disconnect and maybe even kept me safe from intimacy. Who knows? There was all kinds of reasons. Um, but it changed my relationships and certainly changed how I was as a leader. So, you know, this is powerful stuff. He could have told me, you know, to stop it or they're okay. And, you know, but it wouldn't have made a difference. One reflection, one question. So a breakthrough in coaching is learning happens when the frames around the stories that shape our reality crack and a new perspective pops through. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. So, you know, I, I always want to bring this in. I always do in my training because one of the other things I found over the years is that one of the most difficult thing for coaches, you know, is understanding the coaching agreement. I hate that um, definition of the competency coaching agreement. Well, we can agree to anything. You know, what you're looking for is what is it the person wants to have happen that's not happening now. We need a positive desired outcome that we're working toward. Otherwise, you're going to chase your clients all over the place. So this is really important. I call this the structure and flow of coaching that we have bookends. And we must start by looking at helping them. And sometimes this could take the whole session, you know, but I've seen it take time to crystallize the, the perception of, you know, not just the the problem, but again, what is it that they they want? So first we, we confirm, we clarify, we never think we understand. You, you have not lived their experience. So please don't think, oh yeah, I know that, I've been there. No, you haven't. No, you haven't because they've come up in a different way and they have, you know, something, a slightly different view. So please don't assume that. Always be curious. So tell, tell me what you mean by that. A key word like, um, oh, I'm just so disappointed. Well, tell me more about disappointment. What was it you were expecting? Or, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not fulfilled. Well, what would fulfilled look like for you? We have to be curious about what they're saying and then hopefully we can flip it to a positive outcome. What is it they want? You know, what do they want to create for themselves? What do they want more of? Even if we're coaching them not on a problem, but a development, like I wanna be a great leader. What does a great leader look like? And they might say, well, I don't know. I, uh, you know I've never been one. Well, have you worked for leaders? You know, have you recognized leaders, great leaders in your life? What do they do? What about the bad ones? <laughs> what happened there? How can we put that? Make sure that's not in your picture. So we always wanna to get to what is it they want they don't have now? What do they want to happen instead? What do they want it? If they want to improve something, what does it look like? If they need to make a decision, what will the decision give them? Um, or if they want to make a plan, you know, what are they, what's the plan? What's the outcome of the plan? Um, and then we look at why is this important to you now? Um, what's the result that would give you the most satisfaction, not other people? And then we can start looking at what's getting in the way. So please be patient and spend time on this because it's going to really, really uh, uh, make the value of your coaching stand out. If you just go with the first thing that they give, you know, it's like, well, I want to do this. And OK, let's do that. And you hold on to that. You're probably not really getting to what they really want. And I'm going to do a demo for you today so you'll see how I do it. But a big part of that then is exploring their beliefs and assumptions. We clarify the underlying beliefs um, that's holding the story together and the assumptions about the future. And as I said, don't be afraid to be wrong um, because they'll tell you then what's right. And then we take the coaching deeper. So reflective inquiry is where we share what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we're noticing, and even what we're sensing is going on. And again, we can be wrong. So it doesn't matter if it's your interpretation or it's your intuition, just share it and see what they say. 
I often have clients say, no, no, that's not quite it. But then they tell me what it is. <laughs> and that's what I'm looking for. So be wrong, it doesn't matter. So we start by saying, so you're saying this, this is what I hear you telling me. You got quiet, notice any emotional shift. You got quiet or loud, where there seems to be something behind your hesitation. What's going on? What's going on? We're curious about what they're saying, what they're expressing. That's the core of coaching that we often forget when we're stuck in finding the powerful question. So we recap and encapsulate key words. We offer observations, even when they're hesitating, deflecting or resisting, we notice energy shift. This is critical. And if there's emotion, don't back away. Don't back away. One time I had a, I was doing a demo and the manager had to have a difficult conversation. He had to, um, he had promoted a woman to supervisor and it wasn't working out. And he kept saying, she's gonna be so emotional. I just don't know if I can handle it. She might quit. And then all of a sudden he looked away and said, but I thought she'd be the one. And then he came back to, to telling me what he was scared about. And I said, wait, wait, wait. What happened there? You got really quiet. You looked away and you sounded almost sad when you said, I thought she'd be the one. And he got quiet and said, not sad. I'm embarrassed. I think I promoted her too soon. I said, okay. So how are you gonna bring that into your conversation? And all of a sudden it shifted. He said, you know, I need to tell her and I need to offer her that I'll help develop her if she still wants to be a supervisor, which changed the whole tone of the conversation instead of, you know, you didn't do this well, I have to demote you. Just by me noticing the shift in emotion and asking him about it. So never worry about it. And when people cry, just be silent. Give them space. Don't jump in to fix them or tell them don't feel that way. Just let them cry. They'll come out of it. And after a long silence, you can say, so tell me what's going on. Would you be willing to share what's coming up for you now? Most of the time they do. Or even if they get defensive, I had this one very high strung client. She'd get mad at me. And, and one day she got so mad, she hung up on me. <laughs> You know, fortunately, she called me back and said, okay, you're right. And all I had done was, you know, fed back to her what she was telling me about, you know, what she, how she was disciplining her kids. I said, so you're telling me that this is when they do this, this is what you do. And it was really out of proportion. She didn't want to face it, <laughs> but she did, but it took her two days. <laughs> so, right. Oops. It took her two days and she came back and she had that breakthrough. She had that breakthrough. So when we don't allow the full processing of emotions, we deny people a piece of their humanity. So please, please don't stop their emotions or tell them not to feel a certain way or jump in to fix them. Many of you come to coaching from a helping uh, side and you don't want them to feel. You know, let them feel. That's all a part of the growth. It's all a part of the growth. When they start to see their stories, they're going to have emotions. And that's good. That's why, you know, the book I wrote before Coach the Person was The Discomfort Zone, looking at the value of discomfort, not making it go away. I had one guy give me a one star on Amazon. He said, I thought you were going to tell me how to, how to make, make it so I don't feel uncomfortable. And your book says be uncomfortable. I'm like, well, I guess you didn't read the summary of the book, <laughs> you know? So I quit reading my Amazon reviews. <laughs> so I call this hacking the operating system because it's our stories are like the operating systems that run in the background and we don't know it. And we want to be curious about their beliefs, their assumptions, their values and their needs. So I'm going to show this a little bit, values and needs. You know, I, I don't have time to go in depth in it, but if you look on my website, covisioning.com, if you type in emotional triggers, you'll get a list of social needs. I think there's a values list as well. 
um, uh, that certainly I can provide that for you. But, you know, we start with assumptions and beliefs. Those are the easiest things to hear. When I teach coaching, you know, I do exercises where we just listen for assumptions and beliefs and share that back. And it's always profound. Even if the person, what I do is I have someone share a problem for two minutes. And then I get the coaches to, to say, what assumptions and beliefs did you hear? And the person who spoke for two minutes has a breakthrough just from hearing the assumptions and beliefs. But then when we go into social needs, social needs are things that have helped us to be successful. Like, you know, when I, I get attention, I, when I was a kid, getting attention was a good thing. So I love attention. It helps me to stand on a stage and speak to thousands of people. And I'm, I'm good with that. But if I don't get attention, if I go into a networking meeting and nobody pays attention to me, I get angry and I go home. <laughs> so I have to look at, well, wait a second, am I reacting here? What is it that I didn't get that I wanted? So we find that a lot in families, in the workplace, that people, you know, they get angry and they want to change things because they feel like they weren't heard, they weren't valued, they weren't respected. When we start to uncover what is it that you didn't get that you expected? Can you ask for what you need if it's still an ongoing relationship? Or if it's way past, can you release that and, and plan a future where you can get your needs met? So again, look that up on my website. There's far more and this whole list of needs. And, and you know, somebody said, why don't you have feeling appreciated on the list? Well, I change the list all the time. This isn't complete. <laughs> you know, this is um, just what uh, I have right now. But, um, you know, I have uh, my big needs, like I said, being given attention. I like to be recognized. So I love it when people give me nice kudos. Um, but I used to get mad at my boss because he would never, you know, one time I, I worked on this project forever. I gave him the report and he goes, oh, well, that's nice. And I said, but you didn't give me any feedback. And he says, you always do a good job. Do I have to tell you? Remember I said, ask for what you need? I said, yeah, I need to hear that from you. And his response, well, you never tell me when I do a good job. <laughs> and I realized I didn't manage up and I didn't model the behavior I wanted. So, you know, it was just, that little bit of, of understanding that I wasn't getting what I needed. So these are like mine, control. I worked in at companies, I saw what was needed, I took charge, I moved up in management, I started my business, became international in a couple of years. But I run a meeting and somebody like interrupts me and tries to take control and I get triggered. <laughs> you know, and I had to come to understand well, they aren't really taking control. They probably just want attention. Or I could say, hey, can I finish the, you know, what we're doing now and then I'll give you the floor. So social needs are a little bit more adaptable than values, but they overlap. So please don't ask me to differentiate needs from values. Most of the time when we recognize a social need, we can decrease the impact, the emotional impact in not getting the need met. Okay, where values, if we don't live by our values, that's a harder thing to live with. So it's just in identifying the intensity of importance. Do we know um, if this is a social need or a value? I'll show you values in a minute. But again, I think about what are your top three triggers? If you don't get this, you get really upset. It's like, oh, I need to be I need order. I used to, to uh, live with a man who was a surgeon and he needed predictability and order. And, and it wasn't my thing. And that was a point of contention because he felt I was messy. <laughs> you know, and we had to work that out. So sometimes you have to um, negotiate your needs <laughs> when you're in relationship. Um, so values are a little more strongly held. Um, so you might have a value for family, uh, you know, and that's going to be important to you. Um, I have a value for learning. I constantly have to learn. Um, and that's what satisfies me. That's not going to go away. I have a, a value for making a difference. That's why I'm here with you. And I love 
presenting to ICF chapters and coaches. So values are a little stronger and people need to live by their values. And I see it flashing. Is there a question that's coming through? I think a lot of people are, are talking about their social needs. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, the social needs and values, I, you know, I know I'm just brushing through this, um, but, um, you know, it, it's important then to do some work beyond this. I hope I inspire you to learn more. So, you know, oftentimes we see conflicts of values where people might want freedom, but right now they're stuck in their houses with their families and <laughs> they don't get their freedom. Driving me crazy, you know, and because I have a value for running around the world and meeting people because I love challenges and new things. And ah, it's being uh, uh, challenged these days, but I understand it. It's like, okay, it'll come back. I already am booking for the spring and, and next year um, so I can be out in the world again. So, you know, it's not taken away from me. So, Conflicts of values, you hear the word should, 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 I should have this. People tell me I should. Is it their value or your value? Um, whose value? And sometimes they can't get their needs and values met now. You know, they're in a work environment. They can't change it now because of the dynamics. But I always say, okay, if not now, can you plan for a future where you get them met? So that's when I say living outside their values, it just means they can't create it now. So there was a lot of things when I worked for corporate that were important to me that I kind of had to put on the side, cause stress, but I knew I had a plan and that I would be creating my own thing and I would get those values met. So as long as I had a future where I knew I could live by my values, um, uh, then I was okay. I just keep remembering that. So, you know, these are important things that pe why people get stuck in their beliefs, their assumptions, their unmet values and needs. That's how we hack their operating system when we coach them, not the problem that they're facing. Um, this is critical. It helps them see their thinking in a very deep way. Um, and this is what we're doing for them. Again, it's not therapy. We're just looking at, we're reflecting what we hear. We're curious about it. You know, you keep saying should, what does should mean to you? Who should is that? Is that your family? Is that your spouse? Is that society or is it you? Um, or the word, but. Whenever they say, but, there's a fear that comes after it. So explore the fear. You said, you wanna do this, but, you know, you wanna talk to your but boss, but, it's going to be bad. What's going to be bad? Is he going to fire you? Is he just going to yell at you? What's the consequence really? So we just explore these things, what we hear, what we notice. And remember that it's a transition then that they're making of seeing themselves in a different way. And this can be difficult. So don't run from the fire. Walk them through it. Walk them through it. So again, there may be discomfort in that moment. But that's okay. As long as you're okay and you maintain a safe space, the new truth will emerge. And that's the new awareness. This is, is what evoking awareness or ICF competency means. We evoke awareness. So partnering is truly about presence. We don't try to fix, sympathize, backtrack. We slow down and we're with them and not, uh, not stuck in your head. I always say thinking is the enemy of the coach. Quit thinking. I can always tell when I assess, like you're in your head, quit it. <laughs> be present, be in your body. You know, open your heart, open your gut, be fully present, be curious. You don't have to analyze it. You don't have to be right. I just share what comes up. We can talk about it later. And remember how important silence is. When they're thinking and you can see it, don't interrupt that process. Allow the breakthrough to unfold. Hold the silence longer than you feel comfortable doing. See what emerges. It's amazing. It's powerful. And tears, don't be afraid of tears. What if they were just a way of cleansing so we can see the future? We can see the future. 
So we notice and release judgment. We release our emotions. We breathe so we can see people in front of us clearly, clearly. I'm constantly noticing if there's tension in my body and I breathe and release it and come back to being present. This is criti critical for you. This is embodying a coaching mindset, embodying a coaching mindset. So we align our brain, we receive what they're giving us and we watch our judgment. And every time that you think you need to give them advice, you're judging them that they're not capable. So, can you give up being the healer, the expert, or the fixer in order to be the coach? I want you to sit with that. <laughs> give up knowing, be curious, and believe in their potential, that they are creative, resourceful, and whole. Because mastery is truly the deepening of presence, not the perfection of your skills. That's how you go from proficient to profound profound. I want you all to be profound coaches because we're making a difference in this world and it's really important right now. So with that, I'd like to do a demo. Okay. And um, I'm going to do a coaching demonstration of reflective inquiry. I really want you to listen to how I use reflection and I use closed questions. There's another crazy myth that you can never use a closed question. When I'm clarifying what they're thinking, what they're you know, at the beginning of coaching, how they see their problem, I will use closed questions to clarify. And then I open them up. And the ICF competencies never said you can't use a closed question. They said that you have to use more open than closed. It's the balance. So that, that was another crazy thing that even some schools teach, not true. I was there when we wrote the competencies as well. <laughs> you know, they were coming through my fax machine <laughs> back in the day. So notice how I use my presence as well. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share. And I first um, am asking if there's, it was, did any questions come through or no? I didn't see any questions, Marsha. Okay. Okay, I'm sure there will be after the demo. Is there anybody that's like, wow, I would love this opportunity to be coached, that you would be willing to volunteer um, for a brief coaching session with me? And it doesn't have to be life-changing. It could be, why can't I keep my office clean? <laughs> you know? So just a challenge, a dilemma you're facing, that a little coaching would help. But please don't make it, how can I build my coaching business? I'm not gonna help you with that. <laughs> not a mentoring situation so anyone want to volunteer marcia this is ann kelly i i would love that thank you thank you <laughs> pull the shade down so i'm i i uh hear a little i would love that thank you okay so what i would like is for everyone else to turn off their camera um and and be sure you're muted and you can put us in i think it's speaker view or we'll be side by side i'm not sure um maybe no yeah um this uh you know i always get confused on how i maybe if i pin myself and and i pin you i don't see you now And what was your name again, so I can find you on the list? Ann Kelly. Okay. And, you know, um, can one of you, if you see Ann, can you pin her? Ah, there you are. Yeah. Add pin. There we are. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Ann. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we did have a backup person just in case, because sometimes people won't volunteer, but you did. So I, I enjoy that. And also you seem to that you must have, whoops, somebody sharing screen. Mike, could you unshare your screen? Mike, please unshare your screen. AC, if you're host, you should be able to um, right click on him 
and maybe take it away. Okay, I'll do that. There we go. I did it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. Okay, so Anne, you, you must though, you said, oh, I really want this. I'm hoping you had something. Oh yeah, yeah, see, I can see it in your face. You've oh, got yeah. something you'd like to be coached on. So, so tell me a little bit about this, that challenge you're facing. I, I get a little panicked when I get first class mail, when I get letters, um, specifically letters from friends, family, we have it all worked out. You get a birthday card, you get this, we Zoom. No, no problem there. I have a friend from college who wrote to me last year and she hand wrote, which means a lot to me. To hold a pen at my age and write and write and write is a little, and she wrote me a lovely letter and, and how are you? And this is what I'm up to. Love to hear from you. I have not written back. I got that in December, Christmas mm -hmm. of 2019. She wrote to me again this year. I have beat myself up every day. This is on my printer. Wow. It looks at me every day. Mm -hmm. And I have written, I've gotten better at writing to other people. I like her very much, by the way. We, we were friends yeah. in college and uh -huh. uh, she visited me overseas when I lived there. We haven't yeah. been close in touch, but she took the time to write to me. Word. Okay, so, and I, can I share with you? Please. <laughs> you, you know, you started by saying, I, I freak out when I see first class mail, you know, and so, um, uh, but then you went into, uh, you know, it's these handwritten notes and, and um, you know, they're meaningful and how important that is. But then you went into, but I'm not responding, but I'm not responding. So it seemed like you kept going a little deeper into what the, what's really bothering you. So yeah. is it that you're, you're, you're procrastinating, hesitating, responding? That's really the big issue for you. I think that's the outcome. Okay. I don't, I don't know why I don't, I, and I'm, I'm an accomplisher. I, I do a good number of things. But okay, so, so it's out of habit. Out of habit to not just bite the bullet and say, oh, sit down and write a, I haven't okay. started. I haven't started here. I have a picture of uh -huh. her and me in uh -huh. college and I, it says, dear so-and-so. And that's, I think it's about, four weeks old. Okay. So Anne, um, is it that what you would like to is to, uh, the outcome you'd like is to be able to write this or just be able to connect with this person in some way? What is it that you would like? If you were to figure out why, what would it give you? I'd like to start by having a different reaction when I see this card six times a day. The card that you put in front of you. Yes, it sits, you know, right there. Um, like, hello, is today the day? <laughs> but, but that's interesting. Is it that you want to be able to look at the card and, and not have an outcome? Or is it that you want to take action? Which is it, Anne, that you want? I want to feel better when I look at the card. So is, that's it. You just want to feel better when you look at the card. And it doesn't matter whether you respond or not. I think they're tied together. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I, I feel like I need to start with, even if it's a physical, just mm -hmm. okay, change the story. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But I, you know, I need to know what it is that you want. You know, and that's that even seems to be where you're getting lost, <laughs> yeah. you know, because because I'm asking you and you go over here. Well, no, I just want to feel better. Oh, but I want to be able to take my pen and write. So, Anne, tell me, is that it? If, if you were just to look at the card sitting there and say, isn't that nice? And breathe and go on. Would that be enough for you? No, but if I looked at the card and I said, 
they will love me regardless. Mm. And I had a different message. And the big message would be, because I love words to mm -hmm. put them down in writing. If I put words down in writing to someone I talk to every day, it's fine, no problem. But ah. it's part of me going, oh my gosh, I haven't spoken to her in 10, 15 years. So okay. this has got to be a really good letter. And then Okay, I'm that seems to be the big issue right there. <laughs> that it has to be a really big letter. And that's what I've been hesitating or afraid of writing. That it's not going to be big enough. Yeah, so I just won't do it. So you just won't do it. So we're coming back to what you really want is to be able to, well, there's two things again, I heard, you know, you, you said briefly, I want to just accept that they love me how I am. Mm -hmm. But then you said, hmm, it's this really big letter thing. So I'm going to go back. Is it just that you want to accept they love you even if you don't respond or you want to be okay with however you respond? Oh, that would be lovely. Ah. Be, I'm in awe of people who just are, eh, if I do it, I don't do it, it's okay. So however you respond, whether it's writing or not writing, you're okay. I'd like to be. I, I have okay. been berating myself. I come from a line of letter writers. Letter writing is a very big thing. In okay, my so here it is, those words again, big thing, big thing, big thing. So let's just put this over here for now. It may change that what you want to do is be okay with the response that you have right now, that you're not doing it, that you're not doing it. I'd like to feel better about it. About not doing it. No, I, I can't imagine I'm not going to write at some point. I don't know. So, you know what? Here's what I hear, Anne, and please, um, the only reason I, I hope it's okay I interrupt you because you keep coming back to this story <laughs> that you're stuck in and mm -hmm. I'm trying to sort through it. So um, I clearly hear that you do want to respond. That, yes. that, yeah, that, that thing over there is going to bother you till you respond. But I'm hearing your barrier is it won't be profound enough. It won't really stay what's in my heart. And if I cannot write that, that I don't want to write it. I think that's it. Okay. Ah, so let's take a breath. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's just take a look at that, Anne. Um, what's keeping you from writing this is you don't think it'll be good enough. So tell me what that brings up for you when I say that. I measure it against, I put great value in her writing one year after another when I didn't respond and great value in her taking the time mm -hmm. to write that. And mm -hmm. it, it asks for great value in return. So is it deepening your guilt? I'm sure there's some guilt in there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like it. So you said what I heard you say, she's writing me year after year. And it's like you had a lot of emotion on that. It's like I didn't respond and she keeps writing me, <laughs> but I'm still not responding. You know, so, but I still want to come back to this whole thing, Anne, where you said what I write must be profound. It must be big. It must be big. I want to look at that. Okay, not that she keeps writing you and all that, but you said that a number of times. So tell me what big means to you. It, it, it pokes me on a daily basis. That you it have to write big. Because you come from a family of letter writers. This is like right. in your bones. You have to do it big. You have to do it right. How yeah. is that holding you back, Anne, from responding to your friend? Well, I'm, I'm not giving myself the option of just, oh my goodness, I'm good to hear from you, blah, 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 and I'll write more when I have time. Kisses, you know, I mean, that would be fine. I, oh, it'll be fine. So what's stopping you from doing that? Nothing, me, mm -hmm. me telling myself I'm busy. 
ah, you're too busy. That's I'm, your I'm excuse. Busy. I'm busy. Yeah. Yeah, but what you just told me was you were going to say to her, oh, wow, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm busy, you know, and this is why I haven't gone back to you, but I will respond to you because I care and I value you. Okay. So you just told me you, were, you, you could say that. <laughs> yeah. What's stopping you from saying that? Just me. Okay. So if me were to get out of the way, what would you do, Anne? We're going to the post office later today. <laughs> we are. We are. We're mailing a birthday card. Okay. So what does that mean? I, uh, I'm just, oh, see, it's going, well, you know, you can do it today, but it won't be good enough if you wait till tomorrow. It'll be better. <laughs> ah! There's your story. There's your story. Okay, let's back it up. You could do it today. What would that look like? It would be just about what I said to you. It'd be, oh, da 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 Here's a couple pictures, more to come, love. Okay. I know that does, that doesn't fill your standards, and I know that you know, from what you said that you want it to be profound, you want it to be big, but it does provide you something if you do that. Is that enough for now? Yeah, I'm gonna do that because there are other parts of life that are kind of falling apart. And if I can do that, you I can won't have that you. toleration. It won't bother <laughs> you anymore. That's great. And you'll be able to regain that energy. I need it. I need it. If, if it's, if it's 3%, um, yeah. I, I can absolutely use that energy. Use that. That's right. what I want for you, Anne, yeah. is to regain some energy by taking care of this. Yeah. Okay. So what, what do you get out of this? What did you learn in our time together? It, it really confirmed what I suspected that I, I was looking for, um, uh, a letter that was ideal and that wasn't called for or asked for, but somehow I was using it as a uh, an excuse to just keep putting it off. I was shocked really when she wrote the second year. Yeah. I thought, oh my goodness, yeah. what a good person. You know, I want to say it's more than just excuse because it's a part of who you think you are. Ah. You know, because you said you you know you like writing, you you know you like things to be important and and you're feeling like that need is not being met by just sending a little note. And, and yet the need to get it off your table and to connect with this lovely person will be met too. Yeah. So is that meaningful for you? When you said it's part of who I am, um, mm -hmm. it, it really kind of landed. And, and it's, it's a, a subtle part fortunately I don't think it's overwhelming yeah. but um, but in this area boy it was just yeah well you know it is these little things it was Van Gogh who said it's the little emotions that are the captains of our lives and we obey them without thinking about it and here you're thinking about it and you're going to handle it so when are you going to write it Anne? tomorrow no <laughs> um today because I haven't okay. started. I haven't started. Okay. Today before you go to the post office, right? Yes. Okay. Bravo. <laughs> ah, how does that make you feel? Well, I want to write down that excuse is part of who I am. Because to me, that's a huge, I hear excuse a lot in coaching. And yeah, I thought yeah. thought to say, is that a part of who you are? Well, it seemed to be a challenge to who you are, that you can't meet your standards, that you can't be profound um, is who you are, but maybe it doesn't call for that in this situation. Okay. Well, thank you so This is oh, you're so welcome. Thank you're you welcome. very much. Thank you for bringing up something we could coach. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Okay. So we're going to bring everybody back. To, 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 to talk about the coaching. So please don't coach Anne any further. You know, you can thank Anne and um, in the chat, that's great because it was nice that she showed up. Um, but I'm gonna 
unpin us, I think. Can you all come back now if I put you in gallery or do I have to unpin? Remove pin. Uh, I, I did unpin her, so hopefully okay, we can good. all come back. Great. Okay. So I would love to um, hear from, from you. You can unmute yourself. What did you notice? Hey, Jan. <laughs> nice to see you. I love it when my friends show up. <laughs> nice to see you too. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for being here. Okay, you can unmute yourself. You can bring your camera back. Oh, look, there you are. And, um, and, and share what you saw me do with reflection and my presence with her. Or, and if you have questions, please ask questions. Okay, so I see somebody's there. Chris, you're, if you have a question, you're muted. Ah. Hey, no, it, was, uh, it wasn't a question so much, just a, an observation. And thank you for doing it. And thank you, Anne, because that, uh, that was very enlightening and, uh, and, and, and really, uh, I found it very stimulating as well. So thank you both. Um, I really liked the, the way that it, it took maybe a third of the, of the whole conversation before, it may be even longer before you even got to what Anne really wanted. Because I yeah. think uh, so often we spend time and we get the first or second, we might probe once or twice and get to mm -hmm. what we think is the, is the issue. And yeah. I think maybe it's, maybe it's how soon you are into your training, or, but you tend to go and try and build the container. I need to build the container. So I've got what's important. Let me move on to the next, what can I do for you? And I really like the way you said, okay, so what I'm hearing from you and, and it wasn't, is it, is this? And well, no, it's actually not that it's, that's something else. Okay. And just <laughs> probe and probe and probe. So I, I yeah. really, I really thought that was very good. I thought it was, it was enlightening that it's a new approach to me to be able to probe there and not be afraid of using those closed questions as I think you alluded to yeah. earlier in the conversation. So very right. good, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It, it, it is so important. Like I said, I, I have found um, how many times exactly, Chris, what you said is like the coach wants to grab it and move forward. When it's like, well, we haven't quite gotten to it yet, you know, because clients do show up in uh, like all over the place and in a fog and, and they say they want something, but then something else shows up and that's okay. That's where they are, you know, and we're, we're clearing the fog. Remember I said, we're giving clarity and confidence. That's what we do. Clarity and confidence. So thank you for that. Great. Who else wants to share what they noticed? I will. Mm -hmm. um, hey, I, I'm a Marsha Reynolds groupie, so <laughs> I want to say we had a conversation. <laughs> I, one of the things I love, is a couple of things, I love the lightness that you bring to your coaching, and I, I mm -hmm. like that so much. It's not a big deal, even when it is a big deal. It's, yeah. it's not a big deal. We're just, we're just here together. Mm -hmm. And in that vein, I saw just, it was so meaningful to see. And I'm sure everybody in the room felt it when the tension was like, and you go, oh, let's take a breath. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It was, so, it was so easy and so important, I thought, for just sort of bringing it together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know, and, and I don't, that is not a normal practice for me, but it felt like, okay, we got to somewhere and the way she was talking there, she was out of breath a lot. You know, I could feel that because it was making me out of breath. So I, it felt like, okay, great. We just got somewhere important. I want you to sit with that. Let's just take a breath. So it came out of what I sent. So thank you, Linda. That was really great observation. Great. So Todd raised his hand. Did you have something to say, Todd? You can come. Yeah. Um, I noticed also how you did mirror and you kept on looking to your side, the car, just like where she said her card was to the other side uh -huh. like, did the action of like kissing like she did so the mirroring i i i didn't notice quite a bit uh which was great uh one question and, and i don't know if this is just because it was a shortened time um but it did seem like there was a little bit more interrupting than what i would normally mm -hmm. think of coaching or what i do in coaching mm -hmm. um just want to hear your thoughts on that okay um it varies with the client 
Um, if I feel like they're going in circles and they're repeating themselves, I interrupt them. Okay, it's I, you know, I, and 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 frankly, if they're like a verbal processor and they're all over the place, they've never gotten mad at me. Now, if I get a slower thinker that's taking time to get things out, if I interrupt them, and then it's annoying and then it's bad. And so I don't interrupt that. It depends on the person and how scattered are they or are all, I mean, she wasn't scattered. She had just so much and it was really deep for her, you know, but she kept going back to, yeah, but it's over here and it's bothering me, <laughs> you know? And so as soon as they start cycling in their story, I wanna bring it back. Okay, so if you notice, I even said, you know, I, I'm, is it okay if I interrupt you? You know, and I will, if I notice that, okay, this is gonna be an ongoing thing. So I need to get permission to do it. And again, when I get verbal processors and, and people who, who talk things through, talk things through, talk things through, usually they don't mind because they need the clarity because they don't do it on their own. So I've not had, those people never get mad at me for that. Um, but I still like to ask for, for permission. But again, with the slower thinker, I would never do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I did notice you did ask uh, permission there. Mm -hmm. too, so thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. I did have one person um, uh, recently say, you know what, um, I wasn't done. <laughs> you know, the, again, they were thinking and I said something and she said, I really wasn't done with that thought. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. You know, and then we went on. So, you know, that was just what happened. We don't always have to be perfect. <laughs> so very good. Very good. Okay. Who else wants to share? Marsha? Mm-hmm. Hi, and I want to thank Anne too. That was brave, Anne. Thank you. Um, but I really love too because you could feel the pressure she was under, and that I think by you sort of mitigating that, she wasn't allowed to keep doing that to herself, sort of self-flagellating, you know. Yeah. But, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So kind of helping her with that, and I like too how you gave her some language around: Can this be enough? Can this be good enough for now? Yeah. Right? And then that giving herself back some energy ties in with you know that could have led to a bunch of things. What else yeah. do you have going on? You know, yeah. um, what are you needing that energy for? So and that well, she said moment. that I have so much <laughs> other stuff, you know, so I was just reflecting back. Oh, this is going to give you energy then to, to do the other stuff. You know, I want to acknowledge what you just said, though, about um, uh, beating herself up. She clearly to me, um, the procrastination was because the standard she holds herself to, you know, when she said it's got to be big. That was that was the key for me. Remember, I even said that, okay, there it is right there. And she said, yeah, that's it. But then she wanted to back off it, you know? And so I wanted to keep bringing it back to, you know, that what's stopping you is that you, what you want to say has to be so profound that you're afraid you won't do that. That was clearly what the big thing was to me of when she said that, I got that, you know? And so when I even said, that's how you define yourself. She's very proud that she can do that. But in this situation that she's put it off, she's afraid she won't meet that standard. And so that's what it was I wanted to bring to her. I didn't want to say that because that sounds like I'm making her wrong or bad. I just want to reflect it back to her, you know, share what I notice, what I hear, how big it is for her and who she really is. And that is important, but is it necessary in this moment? And that's where they, is it good enough? So I got all that, what she said, but I wasn't going to say it. I needed to bring it to her awareness. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I wasn't going to keep letting her beating herself up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. What else? Anyone else? And if you have questions, you know. Mike, wanna... go ahead. Yeah. You have to unmute yourself, Mike. I'm doing it. I'm unmuted. Look at anyway. Um, yeah, I I was excited from the very beginning when I finally got in here um, uh, about what you had to say. I, I loved the reflection, 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 um, and then no stop, um, and uh, then uh, the um, um, I don't know if its word is validation or. Um, giving her something about uh, 
you, you got it. I mean, I'll use validation. And uh, then getting her to commit, I think that was really important at the end. Um, mm -hmm. In front of all of us, uh, mm -hmm. you are committed. Uh, I always think that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so anyway, that was a beautiful demonstration of everything you said. So thank you thank so much. You. Yeah, and, you're welcome. Um, thank you're welcome. you for the volunteer. Um, so I enjoyed it immensely. I'm going to buy your book. I was looking it up because um, that's exactly what I want to learn more and more about. So thank you. Right. Thank you, Mike. And Mike, thank you for bringing up, you know, I said um, there's a balance of structure and flow in coaching and, and, and really, really working to what they want. That's at the beginning. That's the bookend here. But Mike, what you just identified is there's a bookend at the end that holds it all together. And that's like, okay, so what did you get out of this coaching? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to commit to? Okay, that's structure. You know, I do that every session, you know, so what'd you get, you know, what's next for you, even if it's to go think about it, what's that look like, you know, so it holds together the flow that goes on during the coaching is the structure of the beginning and the end. So thank you for the other bookend, which I hadn't shared in the presentation. Very good. Okay, great. Marcia, I have another question. So, mm -hmm. um, what would you suggest? I know that you said like earlier, just love them as far as like, if you don't know coaching skills, but mm -hmm. uh, in order to improve the practice of reflection, mm -hmm. what would you say would be the best thing to focus on to improve that skill? I think do that in every conversation you have. Take a moment when somebody talks to you and receive what they're saying, appreciate what they're saying. They're just wherever they're at, they're at and summarize, see if you, you know, so let me say, let me make sure I get what you're, what you're saying. Just do that. Just practice summarizing or, or, wow, I can see this is really important to you. Even a couple of minutes, do it with your family, do it with every conversation. You know, it's what I teach leaders, you know, just, um, you know, receive, appreciate, reflect, and then ask a question, you know, to confirm uh, you know, the, oh, okay, so is this what you want? Is this, you know, what this conversation is about? And then you can go into it. So practice it in every conversation. People feel heard and valued and seen when you do that, instead of jumping in to give them advice or what you think and your opinion. Okay? It'll then, you know, to create habits, we have to have discipline practice before they become automatic. So thank you, Todd, for that question of, you know, how do I make this discipline practice? So very good, very good. Okay, I think we have time for one more question before I hand it back to our uh, esteemed hosts. Anyone have a question, comment? Thank you. No, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to hand it back to the host. And, you know, um, I'm always around, um, you know, you, um, uh, I, I mentioned my website, covisioning.com. I'm on LinkedIn. You can always find me if you have a question. Um, I'm happy to answer it because again, too, I, I am so grateful you chose this profession. I think we're really making a difference for people, especially now with this whole pandemic and the way the world is changing, that it's really being called for us coaches to be here. So thank you for choosing, you know, because we, we keep people, we give them that clarity, we uplift their consciousness. And I think we're really making a difference. <laughs> so thank you. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to the hosts. Well, thank you so much, Marsha. I just felt like we were in the hands of a master and it was masterfully done. So thank you so much. We so appreciate you. <laughs> I dropped a link into the chat for our